Chris, I want to welcome you all. Thanks for, for coming. This is a session I've been looking forward to. We're going to uh, learn a little bit about some of our um, faculty's uh, research activity. Um, center for Cybersecurity is a center that I know for me personally is something I'm probably most proud of in my entire career. A wonderful group of people. We pick four of the best here to share a little bit about their research and some observations on research in general, predictions, and maybe even a little discussion around maybe the role and relevance of research in cybersecurity. I know for me personally, I've watched as a great deal of focus in our discipline in cybersecurity has gone toward the startup community and building products and services because there's a lot of money to be made. And the question is, is there still uh, that calling, that need to do research. I'll give you a little hint. You're going to hear yes, but <laughs> we can have a discussion around that. The way we're going to do this is we've got, uh, as I said, four of our best here. I'll spend a few minutes giving each of them a chance to just introduce you a little bit uh, to some of their work and the research they do. Um, and then after we get through that, we'll get into some of the more general uh, topics. If you have a question, I will be monitoring chat. That's a good place. There's also q and I'll watch that too. Whichever you like clicking on, I'll watch them both. And if I see a question that looks like a good one to interrupt the speaker, I will. If it's more general, we'll wait because we'll have a lot, a lot of time towards the back end of this to uh, answer some of your questions. So again, we appreciate you coming and meeting some of our faculty and um, hopefully learning something and, and in particular, coming away a little bit more inspired about research in cybersecurity. Well, I want to start with uh, my friend, Nikhil uh, Gupta. Nikhil, wh why don't you um, take a minute? I'm not going to read your bio, but I'll, le I'll let you introduce yourself. I know you have a few charts. Maybe you can share a little bit about your work. Um, I'll ask sure. you a couple of questions, and I'm sure the, the attendees will have some questions as well. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Ed. Thank you very much. So let me start by sharing my slides, and I do have my introduction briefly here. Uh, I'm a professor in mechanical engineering department, and I direct the composite materials and mechanics lab. So we've been working with lightweight materials for a long time. Uh, these materials are useful in marine applications and uh, armor applications and aerospace applications. Uh, my website address is given here. If anybody needs more information, they can go uh, to this website. So. Uh, I'll talk mostly about additive manufacturing security today. And this work is done in collaboration with a lot of people. Professor Ramesh Kari is here and he will tell his side of cyber security story next. Uh, but we also collaborate with NYU Abu Dhabi, Army Research Lab, National uh, Naval Air uh, Warfare Center, Texas A&M, University of Delaware, City Tech, Strathclyde, and also with number of companies and uh, funding agencies that are funding our work. So uh, why do we want this additive manufacturing? That's a big question that everybody's uh, mind coming from cybersecurity, but not too fa familiar with the manufacturing side. So the reason is uh, that we are able to design and manufacture a lot of products that we could not do uh, before this additive manufacturing came by. So many examples are listed on these, this particular slide. And these examples show the kind of things that we are able to do uh, with additive manufacturing. So on the top left here, there is this uh, hydraulic crossing. People were making them in multiple pieces because of this internal channel geometry that's quite complicated. And once you create two or three pieces, then you have to put them together. So you have seals and gaskets and screws and nuts and bolts. So two piece becomes six or seven piece pretty quickly. And that was uh, really a problem that more joints means more leakages. The same thing happened here with the leap uh, fuel nozzle. This was the first part approved by FAA, developed by GE. And this fuel nozzle used to be more than 20 parts assembled and each of those parts could fail. So you need an inventory. And now this is all one piece construction that doesn't need uh, any repair or anything. Also the example here, many of these aerospace parts used to be very primitive designs because that's all we could manufacture earlier. Our simulations were showing that designs could be more effective, but we just could not have uh, built those things. So now you can see that the last iteration right here is what is being uh, deployed in applications. So many, many examples like personalized medicine is going on and even mass production of car parts 
uh, has started, like BMW just announced that they will print 50,000 parts for their high-end cars uh, using additive manufacturing each year. So this is the scale that we are going to. So what about the cybersecurity needs? I'll spend just a moment here that this additive manufacturing industry is growing at a very rapid pace. Uh, it, it was at $11.9 billion last year, but it's supposed to be $35 billion by 2024. The annual growth rate is somewhere about uh, 20% in past four or five years. And uh, the reports also show that it's not just that the actual additive manufacturing is going to be $35 billion, but the impact is going to be more than $550 billion. And by impact, you can understand that if we re redesign one aerospace part that saves us money and saves us uh, space uh, and weight in that aero system, you can design other things to take advantage of uh, that saving. And uh, there may be a little bit of a question that, you know, aerospace is a highly controlled area. Is there really a need for cybersecurity there? But in traditional manufacturing, many reports have shown that counterfeit or duplicate parts have been deployed in very sensitive systems, uh, including these uh, missile defense systems and uh, army and military helicopters. So there is really a need for cybersecurity going forward because additive manufacturing is going to make it easier to copy parts. So the way this works in additive manufacturing is that we have a CAD model that goes through a lot of uh, simulations and testing. Eventually we finalize the design and we pass it through these steps, uh, intermediate steps of STL file generation, which is uh, a generic file format. It doesn't, it's not a proprietary format. Then we slice them into two dimensional slices and those slices are converted into G code or a tool path. Then this tool path is what goes to the 3D printer. Once the part is printed, it's removed from the print bed and then it goes through a whole bunch of uh, imaging and testing and all that. And all of this process is done using softwares and much of it is done in cloud these days. So there are lots of places where cybersecurity risks can show up and we need to do a real threat analysis to see what makes sense for a particular part. So in our case, we designed, we analyze these threats and we categorize them into four parts. So top two categories, side channel attacks and direct sabotage, they come more from the cybersecurity side and the reverse engineering and counterfeit production, they come more from the physical side. So this AM is a cyber physical system where either you can steal a design file and create a copy, or you can buy a part or obtain a part, and then you can reverse engineer, and you can get to the same point. So protection against all of these is really important. So what is our team doing that's summarized here? In our case, what we are trying to do is uh, look at the uh, security in the CAD files, so once, you, once somebody steals these CAD files, they should not be able to print the part in high quality. That's the challenge. And then we have shown some examples where this can be uh, achieved. We also embed tracking codes inside these parts uh, because now we are doing layer by layer printing process. So these tracking codes can be uh, embedded in one layer or distributed across layers and they can be read. Uh, then we do the authentication using these tracking codes. And then we are working with encryption, cryptography, obfuscation methods, and uh, all those kinds of things. So a lot of different things have to come together in order for us to build these cybersecurity solutions. So one example, each of these things here, what you see here is a example of a gear. And this is the CAD file. Now using this CAD file, if you do everything right, you're going to get the... Uh, part here at the bottom, printing on the XY print bed, very high quality part. But if somebody steals these parts, they are going to get this top part, which is uh, uh, which has defects along these sides here. So same CAD file, just printed in different orientation. There are hidden surfaces, there are hidden features inside that make it difficult to uh, print it in high quality. So we are running the Hack 3D challenge. You are welcome to join the uh, presentation of four teams tomorrow, which are finalists for the design-based security, and that's running on this same uh, uh, hypothesis. Embedded tracking code example is shown here. So instead of having the tracking code in just one layer, we distribute this code into hundreds and hundreds of parts and then distribute those, those uh, segments into many layers, hundreds of layers across the part thickness. And eventually we can do a CT scan and rebuild this part. 
So the example of this cube here, it's a 3D printed part with multi-material printing just for the display purposes. You can rotate it around, you'll see the cloud of points, but you'll see the actual QR code only from a very specific angle. And if this was a sphere, then it's really very difficult to rotate in all different directions to find the, the one direction that shows you the real uh, uh, QR code. There are many other technologies which are required in additive manufacturing. One of them is shown here. So uh, the problem here is that we have these CAD files that we generate with geometries of all different types, but we don't have a method of searching these CAD files based on the geometry. You can search PDFs and Word files based on the text that's written in them, but these are CAD files and geometries can be generated automatically these days using topology optimization methods. And opening hundreds or even thousands of files just to see what's inside is really not a solution. So we've been successful in creating this uh, CAD search engine, which we published two papers very recently, is based on converting them into frequency domain, generating fingerprints, and then matching fingerprints of two files, the search query and the database files, then finding the right match to um, find the right search here. The, and uh, finally, the reverse engineering of 3D printed parts. So all these parts that are created by a lot of intellectual property inside them, um, a lot of effort goes into creating these composite materials and 3D printing them using the print conditions. Now what we can also do is that, uh, can do the machine learning on these parts for designing. But here what we are showing is that once this part is 3D printed, we can do the CT scan of this part. This is one layer of the CT scan here and run the same machine learning algorithm to recreate the part for reverse engineering. So what this work shows is that it's a, it's a double-edged sword when it comes to these advanced machine learning capabilities that you can use them for designing the part, and then you can also use them for reverse engineering the part. So I don't know what can be the security at this point, but this is gonna be a big challenge going forward that how do we create secure systems? So that's all I had from my side, uh, to give you an introduction of the work that we are doing. That's Thank wonderful. you. Nikhil, I want to ask you about the kind of the interdisciplinary aspect of the work here. I'm as an expert in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Um, I wonder if you might comment about um, kind of the opportunity here at NYU that you've had to, to work across the aisle, work with Ramesh and so on. It, 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 what, what's been sort of the inter interdisciplinary experience that you've okay. had with your research? Sure, I'll share this slide one more time because I think the answer is right here that um, two of these threats on the top, they are purely cybersecurity threats. Uh, are you able to see the slide? It looks okay. like the yeah. end of the Sorry. show. So yeah. maybe if you go back. Right here. The two of these uh, side channel attack and direct sabotage by hacking maybe, they are more into the cybersecurity domain and I'm not an expert by any means for cybersecurity. And that part actually comes from Ramesh's group because they've been working with hardware security for a long time and looking into all kinds of threats that we could start from that point um, in our collaboration. And then these reverse engineering and counterfeit production, they come more from the mechanical engineering side that we are working heavily with CAD modeling, uh, reverse engineering and product quality and qualification methods. So field like this, which are cyber physical in nature, we have to be collaborative in, in our approach. Otherwise there are there is no way to completely address all these threats which are uh, inherent to these systems. In side channel attacks, I can give you an example that uh, people can use the audio signature that comes out of 3D printers and use that audio signature to reverse engineer the product. Now, if you didn't have a electrical or computer engineer in your team who's very good with signal processing, this is not something that you could be studying. Well, that's wonderful. I, I wanna thank you for sharing the charts with us. Re re really uh, very nice. And uh, you, you can go ahead and uh, end the share at this point. And what we're gonna do is um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ramesh Kari, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, his very fine work here and the uh, center that he helped to found some number of years ago. So Ramesh, uh, welcome. And I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about um, an update on your work. Uh, uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I was not a cybersecurity 
researcher some time back. When I finished my PhD, I, was a, 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 I have a PhD in computer science and doing some VLSI design and most importantly, testing and uh, VLSI integrated circuit testing. Uh, in fact, I was running after all the experts uh, who were doing testing and reliability. So I was always one step behind or two steps behind or even three steps behind and uh, not exciting. At some point I turned around and started in the opposite direction, which is uh, was, uh, uh, trying to break into these testing methodologies, vulnerable uh, verification and validation methodologies and so on. This was about 10 years ago. And of course, people passed me by, they were running and say, I'm, I was running the wrong line, wrong direction. And fast forward 10 years later, they started following me. And that's when it became exciting. So that's when um, the research that uh, I we started doing in my team, with my team, uh, my students and so on in electronic supply chain security. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, these are once in a lifetime events, I think, moments. I think I'm glad that uh, I took that wrong turn or deliberately took that turn and uh, started looking at the security of the electronic supply chain. And since then, I haven't done anything else. I continue to focus on cybersecurity of electronic supply chain. And of course, the nudge I got was from my colleague um, Nasser, who joined here in, as a cybersecurity expert. Uh, so it's been a fun ride. Um, and I collaborate with a lot of you. Uh, I, uh, for me, I re see collaboration as an interdisciplinary collaboration as a way to make a difference and do something different because I'm not a cyber. If I start doing regular cybersecurity, I might again be behind a lot of people. So, if, but electronic supply chain security, we are one of the best teams in the world. Manufacturing security, we are excited to make a difference, beginning to make a difference. I'm glad that uh, Professor Dworkin is here. He will talk about power grid cybersecurity and so on and so forth. So I'll leave it at that. Ramesh, for um, in the work that you do, um, share us a little bit about some of the um, some of the threats that you think um, are addressed in the research. Because you, you and I both know that manufacturers, practitioners, they they kind of get this, and there's probably a level of protection mm -hmm. that comes from in any factory in any IoT setting. But what, what is that delta when we're doing research? What is the is it is it a threat that's not being addressed? Is it what, what, what is it that drives you each day as you're developing your, uh, doing your research and doing your work? What, are, what is that goal you're trying to reach? Uh, so the two things, so uh, about a dozen years ago, when we talked about Trojans, it was mostly Trojans and software, but uh, because of the distributed nature of the electronic manufacturing, uh, where your design is done at your table, at your desk, and you ship it off to uh, some, uh, foundry which is no longer in the United States uh, or whichever country you are in, it's no longer in the country that you are in. At that point in time, uh, there is this uh, uh, likelihood that uh, someone uh, somewhere along the supply chain might intervene, interdict, and introduce Trojans in hardware, make changes to the circuit so that it can leak either uh, uh, leak sensitive information, either main, via main channels, side channels, or any other channels. So that was how we start. Uh, uh, and in some sense, it's related to bugs and designs, but it's uh, these are, I see them as deliberate bugs introduced into designs that don't affect the functionality, but potentially could create a side channel. So that was one important thing that we said, it's Trojans mean uh, also include hardware Trojans. Uh, in terms of defenses, um, uh, similarly, what you could do is when you have when you go online and order for chips, uh, not uh, potato chips, but the integrated circuits. Um, typically, you get counterfeits. Ninety nine percent of all the chips that you order online are counterfeits. That's okay with you because for me because they're cheap. And in fact, in uh, Nikhil and I were teaching a class and we ordered these. Uh, 3D printers, which were cheap and they fail often, fail uh, uh, in, a, on, uh, in a graceless manner and so on and so forth. So, uh, so counterfeits, when they go into uh, uh, healthcare environment, are an, uh, uh, impact your life. If they go into missiles, they impact national security. If they go into critical infrastructure, they 
create blackouts. So that's the other way of looking at uh, yeah. we make impact there as well. So I'll leave it at this Trojans and counterfeits and similarly a variety of other problems in the electronics that underlie all information systems is what we look at. That's great. I know that students love the, the work that uh, you're doing in your classes. I pre appreciate everything you bring to the school. So thanks, thanks for sharing. Well, next up, Danny, we're going to um, hear a little bit from Danny Wang, who comes to us from uh, UCSB by way of Princeton, where he did his postdoc. Danny, tell us a little bit about your um, research and, your, uh, and the work that you do here at, uh, at our center at NYU. Thanks for the introduction, Ed. Um, so my work is on uh, securing the uh, privacy of IoT devices, like you know things like these, like smart plugs, or you know uh, things like Alexa, um, smart cameras that we live with every day. But you know the thing is, these are black boxes. You hear news all the time about how these devices uh, are constantly watching us and spying on us or listening to us all the time. And my research is actually to spy on these devices instead, trying to figure out empirically that, okay, what do these guys do? What are security and privacy problems? Do they spy on us? What kind of data do they collect from us? What companies do they talk to? So um, that's my high level bit, understanding you know, what these little things can um, damage consumer um, privacy and security. Now, do you have to surround these things like in an operational setting, try to get them to expose and to, to, to operate, to do something that you can pick up? Or is that, the, is that the, um, the approach or is there some other way? What's your strategy for, for doing this? There are two approaches. One, like uh, what Ed mentioned, surround myself with lots of devices and just test them. Uh, that's one way. In fact, uh, this is in my uh, office right now. We have I have a ton of these little things and cameras. You know, just run tests. Another way is that uh, we go out into the wild to real users. So one problem with doing the tests at home is that you know there are only that many devices you can buy um, in the office. You know. Smart plug, if you Google for smart plug, there are like dozens, even hundreds of different smart plug makers on Amazon. That's for smart plugs. And there are like smart cameras. There are a ton of smart cameras. There are like garage door openers, like smart toilets these days. There are all kinds of smart devices. Mm -hmm. You can't possibly buy all of them in your office, in your lab. So it's very hard. What, to what, do you what do you, with the smart plug, give us an example of what sort of test you'd be running. Walk us through the functionality the, of, the, of the test activity. Well, Some of the simple definitely. things we do uh, include, number one, do these things encrypt their traffic? And number <laughs> two, uh, you, you'd be surprised, actually. And number <laughs> two, uh, what data, uh, what, what company they're talking, what companies they're talking. So you're running them, you're, you're intercepting, and you're analyzing what you pick up? Is that yep, one? we are intercepting the traffic. Uh, so our um, main method is actually not so much looking at the firmware, but more of a looking at the network level. What's in a network traffic? Uh, what's the destination? What companies these um, devices talk to? So uh, that's in the in the office. But yeah. back yeah. to my point about uh, you know, there are so many devices, we can't possibly test everything. So uh, our main approach has been going to ask volunteers, thousands of volunteers. But the question is, why would volunteers help us? You know, volunteers may have a dozens of different devices in, in, in their houses, but why would they help us? Why would they help us run tests? So uh, our method is actually build a piece of software that number one, collects traffic for us from these volunteers' homes, and number two, provide some benefits to volunteers, letting the volunteers see exactly what's going on in their smart houses and see you know, whether their smart plugs are sending data to some like random companies or countries. So this software is called IoT Inspector. It does two things. Number one, lets us do research on real consumer um, electronic uh, IoT devices, and number two, it lets consumers figure out what's going on in their houses. Um, we've uh, collected the largest data set of network traffic from basically thousands of different IOT devices, you know, ring, just name anything. Mm. What's, um, the, what's the craziest thing you guys have seen? What's something interesting that uh, has caused you to uh, given you pause when you saw it? Uh, the one of the craziest things we've seen is actually uh, smart TVs. Uh, you know, your everyday <laughs> Roku TV, Amazon right. TV, you think they're made by big companies, but um, there are some pretty, um, creepy things uh, these smart TVs do. So, you know, many of these smart TVs support third-party apps, same way your Android and Apple phone supports third-party applications. So the smart TV apps, many of them actually collect um, data such as your very fine-grained location data that comes from not just, you know, small apps, but, you know, we're talking about apps like CNN and, you know, uh, Animal Planet that actually collect your uh, Wi-Fi SSID, Wi-Fi um, uh, network name, uh, 
and, and this could be used potentially to understand your precise pinpoint your exact location. Um, lots of uh, other examples of uh, you know, email addresses, zip code, um, and other information being collected from you about you on TVs. So that's one probably example. Probably not mentioned in any terms or conditions anywhere, I, I assume. Uh, the terms and conditions, many of which are very, very generic. <laughs> um, that's interesting. That does sound like a lot of fun. So, so yeah, the whole point is actually uh, to help consumers make sense of these black boxes, you know, providing transparency to you know, peek behind the hood, uh, under the hood to see what these things are doing. In the That's back. wonderful. Well, I appreciate you sharing a little bit. You look like you're having some fun there. Um, and, and I hope uh, any students who are on who are interested will uh, be in touch with you. I know you do some teaching. I know that uh, you're probably always on the lookout for good PhD students. So yeah. let's see, uh, Yuri, I was wondering if you'd uh, be willing to share with us a little bit about your fine work. Yuri comes to us from sure. um, EECS here at Tandon. Uh, Yuri, why don't you talk a little bit about um, yourself and your work? We're very interested in um, in having you share um, your 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 act your research activity. Yeah, sure, sure. Can can you see my screen? We can see it just fine. Oh, okay. terrific, terrific. So, um, first of all, thank you Ed for organizing this. Um, it's a terrific event, and I'm looking forward to many interactions. I, I, I'll keep my presentation brief uh, at this moment because I have. Uh, a lecture on power grid cybersecurity a little bit later in the day, but essentially I'm sort of a bridge between what uh, Danny and Ramesh do because Ramesh looks into hardware security. Uh, Huang, uh, uh, Danny is trying to understand uh, uh, IoT security, but actually I'm trying to look into what if they failed for some reason and there are some vulnerabilities that can be exploited to affect the power grid because at the end of the day, the power grid is a combination of hardware equipment and IoT equipment that uh, is being often produced overseas. And when it comes here into the country, it's being installed in a plug and play manner without uh, detailed analysis of the cybersecurity. And uh, the reason why I'm interested in this work is because um, Today, in 2020, we are trying to modernize the electric power grid here in the United States, and we roll out a bunch of technologies such as uh, electric vehicles, uh, renewable power generation, energy storage, demand response, intelligent machine learning tools that are supposed to replace existing, very suboptimal, very heuristic decision support tools that are used in practice. And naturally, these resources connect the hardware world with the cyberspace, which most uh, prominently featured by the communication networks that interface different uh, devices. And as a result of it, that provides an opportunity to compromise the integrity of this communication. And instead of delivering net benefits to the system that would come in the form of a more decentralized, more customer-centric electricity supply with abundant environmental benefits, we might get service disruptions um, instead of it. So the objective of my thrust of work related to ensuring resiliency of the power grid is to basically figure out a way to timely identify those problems and to, uh, and to mitigate their impact on the power grid. In a way, uh, we consider still hypothetical scenarios which become more likely with every day. We consider a scenarios when your microgrid solutions, where your energy storage, your photovoltaic solar panels that you can see in abundant numbers and constantly growing numbers all over upstate, just go north of New York 20, 30 minutes, you will see residential single home family houses, and you will see that uh, essentially one out of three already have solar panels. And the effects of other technologies, what will happen, how uh, the cybersecurity terrain and landscape of power grid operation will change if we have more of those resources and what will happen if these resources are being, are being compromised. An interesting point, and I'm gonna talk about that later today, is that while there is a lot of 
uh, emphasis done on securing high voltage transmission lines and transmission networks, basically the infrastructure that takes uh, electricity at major power plants and deliver it to major consumption cities. There is a lot of emphasis on securing this part of the grid, but there is a relatively fewer efforts on securing what is known as a last, last mile electricity supply. Basically, uh, uh, different um, vulnerabilities that exist on the path from your local substation to your power wall at your home. And that's exactly the kind of work that we're doing here in my group in collaboration with Ramesh and the Center for Cybersecurity. Yuri, how much do you and your students and your team worry about um, real uh, attacks on the electric power grid that would be consequential? I know we I'm trying to think, I don't think in the United States we've had a loss of life yet um, incident. I, 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 may, I might have that wrong. I can't think of one. But do, uh, you, do you guys worry about that? Do you think we're going to start seeing larger scale attacks uh, on the grid? Uh, so uh, attacks on the grid have been out there for quite some time. And probably the most, uh, the most notable and the most impactful of them were not related to cyber vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. They were physical attacks. For example, yeah. there is a very famous a sniper attack in California in 2000, early 2010s when basically a bunch of, uh, an organized group of people, they put up guns, machine guns on a, uh, on a truck and they tried, to, uh, they tried to blow up a substation, right? Uh, but there've been evidence that uh, US power grids have been subject to cyber attacks and that's, that these were primarily attacks that were targeting directly power system equipment and therefore they were mitigated and thwarted. So uh, even though we don't have uh, like, you know, a very prominent example of, you know, long-term um, uh, supply disruptions due to cyber attacks, we can imagine what these disruptions would be if that happened. A few examples would include the 2003 blackout, which was not caused by uh, a cyber attack. It was caused by a combination of different factors, but it was a serious disruption that costed billions of dollars. But right now in the COVID era, uh, there are two concerns. First, that we do have just about a million people here in the United States, uh, which are so-called electricity vulnerable people. Basically, it means that uh, these people cannot sustain, um, sustain uh, a short-term power outage. Short-term means three, four hours without uh, inflicting permanent damage to their health. And uh, um, cyber attacks, uh, even though they can, the system can recover fairly quickly, right? It might cause irreparable damage to these people still because it's impossible to recover from the attack in three, four hours. The second problem is that um, as we look into indirect attack angles, basically when uh, attackers target to compromise electricity supply, not by means directly targeting power system equipment, but rather by means of targeting uh, customer devices. For, for example, IoT devices at your home that control your solar panel or that control your electric vehicle. Uh, these attacks require far less sophistication and planning from the attacker, and they require minimum knowledge on the way how the power grid is operated. So the second problem is that these attacks become a lot more probable, and that's another concern that we have. So despite the fact that we don't have a good example at hand of real life cyber attacks that impacted, impacted a large group of uh, people, in the United States, we are growing in our concern that it may eventually happen. Right, and we all saw the Ukrainian attack, right? That was quite frightening when that, um, that occurred. That, so. th that, th that indeed happened. And the interesting thing is that uh, the, Ukrainian, uh, the, the Ukrainian attack is uh, a direct attack on the power system equipment where you would imagine there should have been some industry grade cyber defense means in place. So most likely it was a combination of attack plus so-called insider's job attack. Uh, that's a slightly different scenario that, than what we anticipate here. Excellent, well, thank you so much for um, coming to the session and sharing. 
Last, but definitely not least, uh, we'll get to my friend, Damon McCoy, who is going to be sharing a little bit about his very fine work here. Damon, thanks for joining. I know you're about triple booked today, but hey, uh, that, <laughs> thanks for making some time. Damon, why don't you um, share with the folks here a little bit about your research and your work? We're looking very much forward to hearing about it. Sure, yeah. Um, so kind of at a high level, right? I, I apply kind of, you know, standard data science techniques to security and privacy problems within there. And so just some examples of the kind of stuff that we've done. We've tried to essentially unravel kind of the operations, both technical and business of for-profit cyber criminals. We've looked at, um, a big one that we looked at was counterfeit pharmaceuticals that are oftentimes advertised through spam. And we unraveled again, the technical infrastructure of how they were delivering the spam, hosting the websites. But the business part was probably the more interesting part in finding that they were kind of in a tenuous position in terms of their payment processing for these things. And that was probably the place to you know, focus um, mitigation efforts on rather than trying to disrupt, say, their technical operations. Um, another one that we've been looking at a lot is what I call kind of these interpersonal attacks and looking at how technology facilitates them. So I did some work with Danny looking at um, how human traffickers leverage technology to kind of facilitate their business and what might be done to kind of disrupt that. We've also looked at intimate partner violence and trying to understand again how technology is facilitating intimate partner violence and where we might be able to kind of mitigate it and make progress. So we've been working with like Google and then that to try and you know, push them to change their policies on the app stores so that it's more difficult for you know, potentially harmful apps to get into these stores and then fall in the hands of attackers. And then um, last but not least, we have been looking at online advertising systems, which have, as probably most people have been aware, been weaponized um, by both you know, for-profit scammers, but you know, probably more importantly by foreign influence actors and now domestic actors to spread you know, disinformation and misinformation through them. And so we've been trying to push on transparency to kind of understand the issue and where, what we might do to mitigate it. Yeah, you know, Damon, this is probably a dumb question, but when people are doing uh, sending spam with like these fake pharmaceuticals, do they make money? Like, is there like a whole equation where you and I would look at it and say, you know, they're making some money there, or is it just a, a ruse? What, what's kind of the no, economics of that whole thing? They are, in fact, making money. Um, we've been lucky to get some really good data on them. So we, um, we just like, you know, lots of information leaks. <laughs> onto the internet um, and the bad guys aren't impervious to leaks within there. So they're essentially their backend databases and financial books leaked onto the internet within there. And um, we found that the, the groups that kind of operate these counterfeit pharmaceuticals, they, um, they are in fact profitable. They're not like wildly profitable. It's more kind of like retail business profitable. So they're making about 15 to 20% profit margins. Um, in this case, they were bringing in about 50 to $60 million a year in revenue. So they were, they were making reasonable amounts of money. That sounds like a lot of money to me. And um, what, what are the, uh, like when, when you're unraveling this, like the work that you and Danny were doing, how do you go about investigating this? Are you using some tools? Is it your clever? Do you have to put on the, the cap of the investigator or the uh, like uh, private eye or something? How, how are you, how are you digging into this stuff? I'm so curious. Yeah. I, I call myself like a data scavenger basically within your right. A lot of it, it is, you know, right. Doing some investigative work to try and, you know, kind of qualitatively understand how it's working. And then based on that qualitative understanding, you know, figuring out what data you can actually get your hands on. And then, right, sometimes, you know, amazing data sets fall into your lap, like that, you know, back-end database from the counterfeit pharmaceutical operations. That's so interesting. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for making a few minutes to share a little bit. I know you're always open to PhD students coming on board. So if there's some folks that are listening, I hope they uh, come on board. Let me try and summarize a little bit for the for the, the participants here, what, what we've heard from the, 
faculty here. First, I want to apologize when we started um, about 10 or 15 minutes late with the problem with the bridge. We lost a little bit of our discussion time and I wanted you to hear from each of the faculty members. But a few things I hope that you'll uh, have noticed here. And by the way, real easy to get in touch with everybody here you know, on our website. You can get everybody's email. It should be very difficult or very, very uh, easy for you to get. That. But one is, I, as I discussed early on, you know, during our uh, Nikhil's presentation, there is a very deep interdisciplinary aspect to the research that goes on in, in our center, um, something we're all very proud of. And one of the advantages of kind of academia in general. So that, that's one thing that I think I hope will come out. We're not, not a typical center for cybersecurity in, the, in that sense, very interdisciplinary. The second is that while a, lo a lot of um, uh, universities do have a focus somewhat on practical problems, I feel like we have a very intense kind of eye to, the, uh, to real practical applications. I mean, I think you've seen it in just about everything that uh, is out here. Mo most of the, um, uh, of the folks that work in our, in our center have deep relationships with industry partners and with um, folks who are practitioners and so on. So it's really nice to, to see that. And the third is that we always try to focus on big problems that have impact, not just on, on you know, locally or regionally, as you saw with some of the, the power grid work that has implication right here in New York City, but certainly to our whole society. I mean, I was so impressed with the work uh, that um, you know, you heard Damon talk about that. That really is super important. I mean, that idea of having integrity in the way we use our networks, and the way social media works, and the way we just uh, operate using email. It's a pr pretty disgusting to me how that has become so degraded and so difficult to, tr to trust. Um, even in my own uh, research, I'll, I'll be giving a talk later on at five o'clock about the work that um, I do. I, I focus on. Um, building a set and running a sentiment index, uh, basically a, an ongoing metric around the, the high level posture, global posture of cybersecurity based on uh, data that comes, sentiment based data that comes from practitioners. And we like it because again, it addresses the broad kind of uh, concerns that we have across um, cybersecurity and across um, society. It also has a nice connection to practitioners and it is absolutely interdisciplinary. We have to <laughs> you know, query data from human beings and prod them to answer our surveys on a frequent basis. So, so let's see, the couple of questions that kind of come in, um, there's one here, Rob Damon, there was a question here about harmful third-party apps on the app store. I was wondering if you, you have any thoughts on uh, how you guys deal with that and what advice you might have. Um, whether, is this a research question or is this a practical question? How do you deal with uh, bad apps that you might be downloading? Um, sure. So normally when I talk about this, we kind of call them dual purpose apps. So these are apps that might have a legitimate purpose, say like, you know, find my iPhone. That's basically a GPS tracker on the phone and so, right, so it can have this legitimate use, but then right, um, you know, a partner can install it on their significant other's phone to stock and monitor them within there. And so right, it becomes difficult at this point to police these kinds of apps. It's almost like policing a knife <laughs> or some of that, right? It can be used you know, to chop up your vegetables or it can be used to stab someone within there. So I think a lot of the work that we focus on with Google is around, um, you know, making sure that the permissions are right and perhaps removing like, you know, the, making it obvious to the device owner that they are being tracked by GPS, these things. Interesting. You know, but question here, Danny, I think that's a good one for you. It's around standards for IoT. Like as you're looking at these devices, beaconing out and doing things, are there any standards groups that are looking to try to define like a UL standard or something for how these devices may be operating and or, or interacting with their environment? NIST claims they have some standard. Um, <laughs> I don't know how good the standard is. The thing is standards, uh, could vary from device to device. Uh, maybe some standards could be like, you know, use secure passwords or use latest TLS 1.2, 1.3. Uh, 
Um, but I'm not sure if there are any standards and how to actually make this standard. It's actually very, very hard. It depends on different devices and depending on what um, device you're talking about as well. Um, my goal is actually, you know, just, you know, before even come to standards, you know, what's the landscape right now? How bad is security? Can we just take a look at, you know, 1,000 random IoT devices in the world and see how bad they are, how good they are? Maybe we can come up with a standard based on that. So that's my current uh, threat right now. Even if it's not a standard, it seems like some basic policies. Like the privacy community has been pretty good about maybe laying out um, best practices, even if, even if you're following some you know, standard, but things like opt in, opt out, and you know, certain certain rights. I would think that certainly in the consumer device area, when I go to buy something, I'd sure like to see that it's been looked into and that it's safe. Or, or was that is they're likely to see something like that? Doesn't seem like NIST would be the place to do that. I don't know. Maybe I have that wrong. So uh, regarding you know uh, certification of device, you should have like an NYU sticker on it, right? <laughs> Your lab checked it out and it, it looks good. I I certainly is. buy based on that. I'm not sure if companies are willing to even go through that step. Uh, part of the hypothesis is that many, there are many companies like long tail of many smart developer, uh, smart mm -hmm. device makers. They just want to push out a product. They don't care about security and privacy. They want to make a product. Uh, having any certifications or standards would only raise um, the bar of entry, market entry. Uh, so I'm not actually really not sure if um, certification would, would be embraced by the long tail of developers. Maybe, maybe, maybe it will be embraced by the big developers. Like, you well, know. the consumer uh, groundswell from consumers like you and I ah. saying, hey, I'm gonna buy a smart TV and I'd like to see that, um, that you've been checked out and you're not beaking ah. out something weird. Right? So the assumption is that consumers actually care about security and privacy, but this is actually not being tested in a while. <laughs> uh, you know, there's like, uh, not, not even test about, you know, let's say there are two, Let's say that you know a consumer wants to buy cameras, and then they see like two cameras on Amazon. One is cheaper, one is more expensive. Do they want to go for the cheaper one, or do they actually care about security and privacy? And if so, what kind of security and privacy do they care? Do they care about you know whether it uses encryption, whether it sends data to some random countries? These are some of the things that are actually not empirically tested, and um, I'd like to really find out before we actually say that hey, consumers actually care about security and privacy. Maybe they don't, maybe they care about price. So um, this empirical threat is something I'm trying to push for right now. I hope you're successful because I think people should care. So we have time for one more. And Yuri, I know there's been a couple of questions, including a separate one about um, kind of privacy issues in the context of uh, your work. That's interesting because we would tend to think of the area that you work in being all about disruption and modification of, of systems. But do you see privacy issues, Yuri, in the, um, uh, in the work that you do? I thought that was yes, an interesting uh, question uh, that came uh, over. I would not necessarily describe it as an issue, but I would uh, see that it's an important barrier that we have in place because as uh, more customer and resources we integrate into the modern power grid, uh, the more we become aware of privacy implications because previously, there was not much information that you could um, defer or infer from uh, observing how people consume electricity. These days we can um, combine a lot of information from their consumption patterns because this information not only comes with energy data, it comes with a lot of uh, other footprints, for example, uh, which apps they're using to consume it or which devices they're using to consume because every device or app, they have their unique energy signature. So from this perspective, it's very important to understand the facts uh, to what extent people would like to sacrifice their privacy and provide this information because from our perspective, that would help to defend the power grid because it will help us to establish benchmark electricity consumption based on features of every consumer and it will facilitate identifying anomalies that would indicate that there is probably a cyber attack in place. Yeah. Without customer sacrificing privacy, unfortunately, it's very difficult to do, but we understand that we cannot ask electricity customers to sacrifice their, their privacy for nothing. We should to offer something in return, and that could come as a rebate to their electricity bill, or it could be some uh, fairly granular privacy settings. For example, I don't want you to use information when I use this device 
or share information when I use that device. So from uh, 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 this uh, perspective, it's an ongoing but very interesting conversation. That's fantastic. Well, listen, on behalf of the folks listening and for all of us, I want to thank each of the faculty members for their wonderful um, presentations and information shared. Thanks all for uh, joining. A number of us have other talks later. Um, you've heard people mention. I hope you'll come to my five o'clock talk on metrics and we'll, uh, we'll see you later. I hope you're enjoying Seesaw and we'll see you later. Take care, everyone.